Hello everyone, welcome to the second season of our project in Outside Opinion. My name is Oleg Rybachuk and I am the head of NGO Center of United Actions. My guests are the ambassadors who represent the states of successful democracies and working system of checks and balances. We are discussing the Ukrainian path to the European Union, the reforms and recovery, and how the world security system should look after the war. Today my guest is Ilgwar Sklava, the ambassador extraordinary and plenty potentiary of the Republic of Latvia to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for this opportunity to talk to you, because Latvia belongs to the uh, most reliable, like Baltic countries, uh, allies of Ukraine, the country which doesn't need uh, much uh, explanations or motivation to to, to support us in our fight, in, in our ambition to become part of European Union. You started your road to a European Union in the first wave of enlargement in 2004. What is your experience from that time? What lessons can Ukraine learn from the way you have been entering European Union a long time ago? Right. In our case, in case of Latvia, uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, how to say, our way to European Union, it, it went in parallel with the way to NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And um, the, it, uh, these two were strategic goals of uh, Latvian uh, foreign policy, um, foreign and security policy. And, um, you know, the main task was to make independence of Latvia irreversible. I mean, that was the main uh, leading uh, motive behind uh, moving uh, towards joining European Union and NATO. Of course, there is, uh, there is a difference. NATO is mostly about the hard security, about military security, military planning, uh, to avert, to avoid a military conflict in the region, the possibility of creating a military conflict in the region by aggressive powers like Russia today. and. Uh, the European Union is mostly um, about our economic development, first of all, first hand. And the European Union for us also was a um, kind of motivator for quick uh, or rapid changes within society and modernizing our economy. Coming out from the Soviet Union with, uh, with a non-existent uh, market economy at the end of 80s, and then, uh, of course, how do you build the well-being of your society? And the European Union was, was one secure way how to do that and uh, probably, uh, possibly the fastest way how you can achieve uh, economic prosperity, economic development, technological modernization, openness of society and uh, establishing uh, many, many international contacts also in business field. But uh, about Ukraine and comparisons, it's not so easy to compare, of course, because we are the countries of uh, uh, different size, first of all, and um, also geographical location and uh, history is somewhat different. Uh, but I think um, the effect of the European Union uh, upon Ukraine will be uh, something similar. It's a modernization, technological modernization, uh, establishing standardized rules and procedures, uh, also concerning the rule of law, uh, field of justice um, uh, system, which helps enormously uh, development of, of, of business, uh, growing business, standardizing uh, legislation, what concerns property rights, many other things. It helps simply to develop uh, economically. It helps the country to, to, to develop economically. You just mentioned In an organized kind of uh, organized manner. EU or NATO, one thing is absolutely clear. In order to qualify, you must do a lot of essential No results. doubt. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was recently emphasized by head of EU office in Kiev. Sure. But in, in Ukraine, uh, sometimes you hear voices that we are at war. So how you can do? Do you have to do reforms when you are at war? Or you can postpone reforms uh, until the war is over? 
Well, uh, that's the trick, I think. If you postpone reforms until the war is over, then probably there will be limited success in negotiations with the European Union. I mean, that's, that's undeniable. So you have, to ha you have to try your best to do uh, both. Uh, that would be my answer, because um, you, you want to achieve the progress with the European Union as quickly as possible. And without uh, making reforms, it won't be possible uh, in, in, in a somewhat quick manner. So you have to do both, um, I'm sure. It's difficult, it's double difficult, of course, in a wartime. But on the other hand, um, the reforms which are, how to say, um, asked, demanded to, to be carried out, uh, they basically, they also strengthen your country. I mean, that's undeniable. I mean, if you do reforming, uh, be it, I don't know, state administration, legal system, uh, how do you conduct business? It strengthens your, your country. It makes it more better operational, so to say. Since uh, 2022, when uh, next uh, level of Russian uh, uh, aggression, full-scale war in Ukraine happened, your country was always very supportive, militarily, politically, economically. But there are a number of countries in the European Union at least uh, talk about some of the countries fe feeling, uh, if not tired, then probably uh, having some reservations that they believe that they cannot drag this burden for a long time. What, what should we do about it? Do you feel the threat that this European solidarity might have weak chains and can just Crap. break? No. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, well, starting with us first and then moving to other European countries. No, I, I think Baltics, uh, specifically Poland, but uh, mostly uh, the Romania and other countries, even Bulgaria, and, and uh, which have no, uh, no direct border uh, or close border or uh, geographically close to the, to the, to the Russian borders. Uh, we do recognize the threat of um, Russian expansionism, Russian imperialism, and um, this is historical experience of our own nations, of our own countries. Mm, therefore, there is no doubt, I mean, plus uh, our societies are rather well informed what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on on the front line, uh, what is happening there. So uh, there is no question about supporting Ukraine. I mean, we recognize the situation. For us, it's basically black and white. There, there is no gray zone in between. It's so bluntly clear uh, what the Russians are doing, what their goals are, and uh, how they try to subdue Ukraine. And uh, for us, it's, uh, we recognize it as a threat, as a threat and uh, act accordingly. We support Ukraine, of course. Uh, as for the rest of the Europe, no, I, I don't see any cracks anymore, uh, any time soon in, in, uh, on the European side, European Union side, as we see the budgeting, uh, I mean, financial support for several years ahead. Uh, Europe was, uh, was fully able, capable to adopt this budget perspective, this um, uh, support money for Ukraine. And uh, that's a sign that uh, there is no fatigue or, or any, that they, no, no one is tired. Of course, the, uh, there was a big discussion about uh, Hungary and their maneuvering uh, around and conditions and so on and so on, their national politics. But the uh, European Union perfectly well did find a way how to solve this and how to move forward. What can happen, of course, the question is about moving forward how quickly, I mean, how long it takes, uh, what kind of discussions and so on. Mm, but uh, I think Europe is uh, undergoing a fundamental uh, changes, tectonic changes, in fact. If we look at Germany, for instance, in Germany, tectonic changes have happened since the February of 2022. 5,000 helmets. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, look uh, where they come from. I mean, yeah. they come from uh, doctrine that they will not supply weapons to conflict areas. And now, look, I mean, there is a discussion about uh, this or that missile system. Uh, do we give it uh, now or do we give it later? Do we give it... To Ukraine at all, but uh, but it's about weapons and uh, lots of weapons, loads of weapons 
and systems have been delivered already to Ukraine. So that's a, that's a fundamental change in two years' time. And that only means that the countries, uh, leadership societies, they recognize the threat, what Putin is creating for Europe, for the whole of Europe, uh, for the system that exists in Europe. It's existential threat. Yes, uh, politicians in these countries, they have to work with their population to explain. I mean, uh, because sometimes um, uh, some segments of society, bigger or smaller, they are oblivious to uh, kind of outside political events. They have enough their own trouble. I mean, how to pay bills, uh, how to, what kind of school for their kids, how to, how to find a better job and how to build a house and s s things like that. Daily business. And uh, sometimes they get oblivious, uh, take for granted that everything is peaceful and there is no conflict on their doorstep. But the politicians have to give them this perspective and connecting dots. I mean, what leads to the next uh, next stage? I mean, what are the consequences of Russian politics, Russian aggressive military politics, attacking neighbors in Europe on European continent? Uh, so politicians have to do this job with their domestic audiences in other European countries. For Latvia, it's um, more or less, I would say, it's clear. I mean, we, we have rather well informed society and uh, very supportive to Ukraine. Without the uh, support of Latvian society, the government wouldn't be able to do much, uh, that much as, as, as we are doing in, in providing support to Ukraine. You mentioned uh, uh, very important for Ukraine, almost life-saving decision to allocate 50 billion of euros, specifically when there are still uh, uncertainty with uh, US Congress. But on that, that decision was first delayed, and then there was lots of nerves burned sure. because of, again, you mentioned Orban and Hungary. So the, 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 this um, possibility of one member uh, actually blackmailing the rest of European family, that are there any discussions within EU how to minimize these risks in future? Because we are talking about uh, rather big wave of enlargement. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I would not say that there is a actively going on debate, but that's on the backs of the minds of uh, many leaders and parliamentarians uh, in European Union countries. Because uh, uh, with every enlargement, of course, there is a certain degree of uh, what comes with is a certain degree of a risk uh, that uh, future decision making might get co more complicated because additional additional national interests are put on a table. So to say more countries, more national interests have to be addressed. So how to do that in the best possible way? That's an open question. There is no to my knowledge, there is no active debate at the moment, but uh, definitely this subject of uh, changes in voting uh, together with uh, changes of management of the whole European uh, Union, how to say administration or, or, or management, uh, that's coming up from time to time and uh, sort of in discussions among politicians and parliamentarians, but there is no active debate or active program uh, yet or at the moment how to do that but uh, I, I I would not exclude I would bet rather that we will come to some changes uh, um, aimed at better management of the European Union affairs in the future. In this wave of enlargement there are countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Serbia, maybe other countries which are not known for very strong uh, institutional uh, capacities mm -hmm. and some, some members of EU uh, are raising concerns that uh, th with these countries becoming members of EU there might be risks of them uh, becoming weak chains again because of their history and this is a challenge because the bigger EU becomes, you need this uh, mechanism to function effectively. And when you have some countries which, which may join, yeah. and we, we know that, well, Hungary is obvious illustration, okay, Slovakia probably, but we don't know how many others could be there. 
who on the way to EU promised a lot. Then Stepped back from their promises, back. yeah. There is a risk, of course, always. There is a risk, but... Uh, and I do, therefore, I do not exclude that there might be some mechanisms, uh, how to say, uh, putting limits or some measurements or some tests on, uh, on countries even beyond the point of joining the European Union. I cannot exclude that because if we look, uh, if we look at the um, Romania and Bulgaria, for instance, example, they joined the European Union. But then a very long period of time, they were not a part of Schengen area. They are becoming now, but, uh, but uh, because of obje objections of a uh, number of countries and uh, that process was somewhat slow. And there were objections about handling borders, about capacity, about fighting corruption and so on and so on. I cannot exclude that certain mechanisms of evaluation might be put in place for the uh, for the countries coming in in next wave of enlargement, even beyond the date of joining, actual joining the European Union. I cannot exclude that. I don't know that, but we will see. It's a process. But also, um, stepping inside the European Union, it's also a mutual dependency. Uh, you are joining single market. You are joining um, uh, single, single economic zone. Uh, it's um, basically that creates also mutual dependencies. So whatever the country, even Hungary, I mean, so much disputed in media, they have to reckon, they have to count uh, other, uh, how to say, influences of other countries, influences of single market on their domestic politics. They cannot totally ignore that. So they have to, they have to uh, how to say, coordinate their policy uh, and to, to have that in mind, which eventually also in the end happened uh, regarding the decision of 50, 50 billion euros um, support for, for Ukraine. How do you think Ukraine should act institutionally to the challenge, to the change of social contract within EU members. I mean, uh, s uh, among some uh, new or rather new members of EU, there is a fear that they will have to, to change the status of the recipient mm -hmm. of EU support. Uh, they should move into category of donors. Yeah. It looks like prestigious, but you know that Th th this is the issue. No, I mean, uh, I have a list uh, of countries there. I looked yesterday who is recipient, who is a donor currently uh, and the European Union. But no, I, I mean, for us, it's a natural process. I mean, you, you grow economically and you reach a certain level and, uh, and then you become a, a certain level of uh, uh, GDP per capita and then you become a donor from recipient to donor. Ideally, all countries reach certain level and in the end no one is donor. I mean, not internally at least, we help the outside world, uh, third countries. But ideally we reach the point, and that's the aim, I mean, uh, of, of, of co cohesion policy, that we uh, reach the same, uh, more or less the same level of development uh, economically and the same level of uh, GDP per capita or comparable levels. It's a long run, of course, but for us, it's, it's a natural. We count uh, that this day will come when we become donors, obviously. I mean, with growing economy, and our economy has been growing all the time, apart from uh, crisis years 2009, 2010, and then uh, COVID, of course, uh, was a drop um, of economy. But generally, our economy is growing all the time, and we are catching up with, uh, with the rest of the Europe, with Western Europe. And obviously, the day will come when also Latvia becomes a donor. It's unavoidable, basically. The day will come when war will be over in Ukraine, and uh, I have no doubt we will win in this war. We will, we will defend our sovereignty and try to become a member of, of, of democratic uh, uh, union, European Union. But how, from your point of view, does this... Um, recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine looks like. Uh, what should we do to maintain or to build up credibility with foreign partners, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion? 
No, uh, as, as concerns internal politics in Ukraine, of course, transparency and uh, effective uh, justice system and uh, fighting effectively corruption is the uh, first point what comes to my mind. That is very important also regarding the con uh, reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, because the money uh, which is given, it cannot be stolen. It, uh, one should not, it, it cannot be, it would be very damaging if it is stolen, large amounts of the, this money uh, if it is stolen. That would totally diminish uh, willingness of other countries to help Ukraine. That's a, the, for that you need very well functioning uh, justice system and uh, effective institutions fighting corruption. The other thing is outside, uh, outside element, I think the, it's all about the money, of course, how much money comes into Ukraine. In a positive scenario where, um, to a large extent, Russian foreign assets uh, or Russian assets, state assets included in foreign countries, if they are arrested and this money confiscated and this money is diverted to Ukraine, that covers a large portion uh, of, um, of war damage already. So that's a, that's a capital to start with uh, reconstruction in a serious manner. Uh, if it is done, uh, that's a sizable amount of money and uh, I can imagine that Ukraine turns into a big, big building site after the war. I mean, construction site. Uh, new cities being built, new industries being built with that money which is confiscated uh, from, uh, from Russian state assets. Because uh, unavoidably, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a fair and, fair and just approach that the aggressor must pay for the damage he has caused, and they have caused a lot of damage, and they must pay. What impact the war in Ukraine has on Latvia and EU in general? And what conclusions, uh, in your opinion, uh, were made or are to be made by EU uh, and by, by, by Latvia? First of all, of course, there is economic impact. I mean, uh, because uh, the Russian raw materials, it affects all the prices we have to divert uh, our, um, uh, I don't know, resources import from Russia and uh, to other countries. We have to seek uh, other replacements, even partially from doing that with Ukraine. I mean, uh, replacing certain things, I mean, uh, which we have imported from Russia. Now we probably can look uh, to import from Ukraine. But uh, it, all in all, yeah, it has a tremendous impact on, uh, on um, also on large economies of the European Union, like Germany, like France, all who have been doing uh, sizable, substantial business in Russia. Uh, selling machinery, for instance, uh, Germany or, or, or France, um, uh, importing raw materials from Russia, of course it has impact, uh, the sanctions have impact, but there is a choice. I mean, you cannot support um, uh, aggressive war in Europe. You have to take away resources from uh, from that country, which is invading neighbors. You have to. There has be has to be uh, economic price to be paid for for that aggressive behavior. But it doesn't make our life easier as well. I mean, we we all feel that pressure, mm, especially first winter. That was uh, 2022, 23. And the raw material prices were skyrocketing, uh, and they are not still back to the pre-war pre-war um, levels. But for instance, heating bills uh, totally increased, and uh, uh, gasoline for cars uh, the prices increased. That's a that's an issue uh, for European countries to tackle because we are all affected. Of course, with uh, time passing by, we can find other markets, other deliveries, other, other routes. Uh, but it takes time and it takes effort and it has impact on prices. But we have no other choice. I mean, we cannot accept um, the war on the European continent and saying that it's just fine. No, we can't do that. Therefore, I'll also, first of all, uh, first reaction, it's economic, economic measures to punish, economic measures to restrain, economic me measures to take away uh, resources from that aggressive war machinery. Uh, it doesn't mean that Russia will fall apart uh, because of that or will starve, not at all, but uh, they, they have internal production, but you cannot stimulate by European money the Russian war machinery and uh, their aggressive um, foreign policy goals. Uh, that's that's uh, as, a, as a starter. 
military cooperation between our countries are rapidly growing. You know that there is a certain trend of creating different kind of coalitions between different countries. Latvia initiated drone coalition mm -hmm. with Ukraine. What do you think was standing behind this? Why drone coalition? Right. Uh, drone uh, coalition is one element. Uh, I mean, uh, to finish the previous point, uh, uh, what the Europe should do, what kind of lessons draw from this aggressive war uh, conducted by Russia against Ukraine, I think we have to invest more in our security, in technologies, European countries. For a long time, we have been relying on, on the United States and uh, under financing our own defenses. And that goes for all European or mostly uh, for uh, for uh, majority of European countries, look at the Germany's defense budget, how much from uh, from percentage wise from GDP they were spending on defense. Um, maybe British British were better and French were better and and Turkish Tur Turkey was better, but uh, but uh, all in all, European continent Western Europe was spending very little on defense. Has to be changed. The drone coalition is just a sign, one sign of that change, and uh, we all know that the modern battlefield changes very rapidly, uh, technologically speaking. And the drones are one, one uh, is one segment which is uh, how to say, which manifests this change on the battlefield. It's technology that is developing very rapidly, and um, also our businesses they see opportunities there in this technological development and um, we cannot that's a one thing is a business opportunity the other thing is we cannot lag behind we cannot stay behind the technological development also in this field so of course we have tremendous interest in developing a drone coalition and uh, being active actively um, pursuing this this uh, drone how to say segment on a, on a battlefield because it's uh, it's part of the future battlefield. We have to be aware of it, we have to be part of it, we have to know it and uh, how to deal with it. After the war, uh, uh, when the war is over, it doesn't mean automatically we'll become, become members of NATO next day because this is the best guarantee. But uh, how would you uh, describe or how would you explain to Ukrainians how this forms of transitional umbrella for Ukrainian security could look like after the war? No, I, uh, they, they contain very important things, very important elements, those, uh, those memorandums and those agreements, because, um, because uh, it provides for um, transfer of resources or, or providing resources in times of crisis, uh, securing basically uh, in a certain time frame, even uh, be it 10 years or shorter. Yeah, normally 10 years. Yeah, I, I mean, that's very important because um, it doesn't, we cannot today, we cannot predict, we cannot make prognosis um, when this war will be over, that it's, it's forever over. I mean, that everything is solved. There might be tensions uh, left and uh, in order to, how to say, to cope with these tensions, to um, take precautionary measures, uh, those uh, these agreements, those memorandums become very, very handy. I mean, they, they are very important because it secures you a certain degree of resources, delivery and uh, assistance and coordination with other countries until the point when you enter the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance. And it is encouraging that we do have this kind of understanding and support uh, like uh, your country, like Latvia, like those countries who uh, there was this saying that there are some countries who call for good relationship with Russia. Mm. And there are countries who know what does it mean to have any kind of relationship with Russia. So no, I, thank you for this. It's naturally that every country wants a good relationship with, uh, with its neighbors. But uh, then what kind of neighbors? What's, what they are doing? It cannot be one-sided good relationship. It should be both, both, both ways street and two-way street and uh, and currently we see just the opposite to good neighborly relations with uh, with russia what they are doing what's their policy is you're bombing peaceful cities you're killing civilians in a neighboring country what the hell is that i mean how how there could be good uh, good relationship now i can't really see um, the slightest chance that um, russia could succeed in reaching its goals in Ukraine. I, I simply can't see it. I mean, I, I, I don't believe it. 
I don't believe it. I, I, and since it's not being done, it will not be done, then the outcome is more or less clear. I mean, but I can't see that Russia could reach, uh, could accomplish its goals in, in Ukraine. I mean, it's just, just uh, it cannot be.